So let's um, dive a little bit into what the EV Arc does. Uh, you have on your website that you call it uh, the EV Arc 2020. I assume that's kind of the year it was conceived or deployed. Um, but I've got all sorts of attributes. I'd love to hear your your twist on that. I mean, it's you know I hate to say it, but the charging infrastructure can be a cure for your insomnia, and you are doing something much much different than what everybody else seems to be doing. And um, you know, I'd love to hear the details of how it's different, and especially with the focus on EV Arc and and uh, how it's working out for you. Yes, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, charging infra discussions about charging infrastructure can be, and I, I like your term, a cure for insomnia. Uh, and, and it shouldn't be, because actually it's one of the most exciting things that, that has happened, uh, certainly from an infrastructure point of view, and that is happening uh, for 100 plus years. Uh, and it also should be very, very exciting to the consumer, uh, because it's going to change radically uh, the way they fuel their vehicles, the economics around fueling their vehicles, and, and frankly, just the joy of driving. Uh, you, you, you're able to get some of it back. Uh, moving away from this sort of entrenched model that we have right now. So e EV charging infrastructure ought to be exciting, but at the same time, it ought to happen without a great deal of theatrics. Uh, and that's, you know, that's the problem. Here we've got something that's uh, on the surface kind of boring from a consumer point of view, but is in fact very dramatic in terms of what it takes to get, to get it done. Uh, I, I would say that one of the greatest aspects of the EV Arc product and a couple of the other products that we have in our portfolio uh, is that they remove the drama from the deployment of electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Uh, and chiefly, uh, the way EV Arc does that is, be, is in that it provides EV charging infrastructure solutions, but without all of the things that you would typically associate with that. So we're able to uh, deploy an electric vehicle charger or up to six electric vehicle chargers on a single EV Arc with no construction, no electrical work. So no construction means no trenching, no pouring concrete, no foundations, not, not, none of those things. No electrical work means no pulling wires, conduit, no transformer, switch gear upgrades, uh, none of those. And all of that means uh, no permitting because we don't trigger any of the normal permitting uh, requirements because we're not digging up the streets and we're not doing electrical work. We're not, we're, there's no special inspections required or anything else uh, like that. And then beyond that, it means that you don't get a utility bill because the unit generates and importantly stores all of its own electricity. And we can come back to that in a minute. Um, uh, and then uh, you're immune to blackouts and brownouts as well. One of the under discussed things where electrification of transportation is concerned uh, is what will we do when we need fuel, uh, but we're having a, a, a you know, prolonged uh, blackout or brown, which, which uh, frankly happened more often than we like, and in fact, more frequently today than at any time in our history, uh, as we're moving into this period where we're more reliant on electricity. So EV Arc is really a, dr a drama reducer, um, but I hope it adds excitement. So like, in, in a way, we're sort of upending that, right? It's, it's no longer boring infrastructure with a lot of drama to get it deployed. Now it's sort of exciting infrastructure with no drama to get it deployed. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, the whole idea of being able to set up out in the wilderness without the need for any sort of grid infrastructure is a wonderful way forward by itself. It's one of the, the worst use cases for the EV is if you're traveling in the wilderness. So you've got a way to solve that for those with the wherewithal and, uh, you know, companies who may want to do this in remote areas could probably reap big benefits as the uh, EV um, activity scales up in the United States. So I noticed a couple of no, other specs. If I could just jump in there sure, for a second. Sure, sure. What, what's, what's really fascinating about this, actually, is that the great majority of EV Arc deployments are not in remote locations. They're in heavily urbanized environments. I mean, New York City is our largest municipal customer. The, the U.S. Army is our largest customer, but New York City is our largest uh, municipal customer. And we are deployed thickly through the five boroughs. And so then you say to yourself, well, hang on a minute. Why, why do you need an off-grid solution in the middle of the, the largest empty in the nation, you know, it's a, it, 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 w w what's going on here? And it turns out that actually it is often more complicated to deliver an electric circuit across a street uh, or outside of a building in a place like New York City. Uh, more permitting, more environmental impact studies, m m construction costs much higher, disruption much more impactful, 
Um, and, and then, frankly, the biggest issue is lack of capacity. There simply isn't capacity to add the circuits that are required to do this. And so while our product on the, on the face of it seems like a very obvious solution for remote deployments, and frank, yes, we are in national parks. We're in all sorts of places where it would cost millions of dollars to dig the trenches and deliver the, the grids. But actually, the vast majority of the units that we have deployed, hundreds and hundreds of them across the United States, uh, are in densely uh, urban areas because it's just so expensive, so disruptive, uh, and often impossible uh, to deliver the grid to the place where people park cars in those types of environments. We solve that. Very nice. And, you know, I notice also that uh, it's quite a large solar array. I don't know if the specs have evolved, but 4.4 uh, kilowatts of solar power. That's nothing to sneeze at. Um, being able to withstand 160 mile an hour winds. Okay, that gives you some flexibility in where you deploy it. Um, wide operating temperature range, um, operating at colder temperatures than most EVs will charge at. Uh, so that's always nice. Same with the upper temperature range. Um, you know, uh, different storage options, um, you know, power output up to almost six kilowatts if the specs remain the same as they are on the website that is. So what can you say about those things? I mean, this is sort of unique. Um, can the solar array be larger? Can you accommodate other types? I know you're trying to focus on a product here and everyone's gonna want that product to be something different. So what sort of variants do you uh, support, if any? Yeah, it's a really interesting point, actually. Uh, one of the one, in the early days when we were doing this, uh, uh, we we got a lot of requests to you know alter the product. Can you make it this? Can you make it a bit more of that and a bit less of this and all that sort of stuff? And you're right, we had to discipline ourselves. And one of the great challenges has been coming up with a product which we can deploy in any. It, the, the, one of the one of the many fantastic things about the, these United States of America is that you have every conceivable condition here. If you can deploy broadly across the U.S., you can deploy anywhere in the world, frankly, uh, because you have the conditions in this country which are which match just about everything. Perhaps the tip of the Arctic or Antarctica we can't match, but everything else, we've got the hottest deserts. We've got places where hurricanes and tremendous humidity uh, run through. We've got incredibly low temperatures up in the Midwest uh, in the winter. You know, we have a, an operation in Chicago and I go there a lot. And, uh, you know, I know what it's like to have my extremities feel painful as I walk down the street, you know, uh, to the office, partly because I'm a fool that never takes a coat when I go there but, uh, or gloves. But nevertheless, it, we, we have these tremendously extreme uh, environments uh, across the United States. And we had to, con we had to develop a product which could be deployed in all of those environments and provide what our customers needed in all of those uh, deployments. And one of the things you mentioned was operating temperature. Certainly, uh, that, that was probably the biggest hurdle we had to cross, actually. Um, batteries and other electronics, but particularly batteries, a bit like Goldilocks, uh, they don't like things too hot or too cold. Um, and so the traditional way of keeping batteries in, a, in that Goldilocks zone uh, is to heat them or to air condition them. Um, but of course, we have a finite source of electricity. You mentioned that 4.4 kilowatt solar array. Uh, what we want to do is put all the energy that we convert from sunlight into electricity into the car. We don't want to use large amounts of it on parasitic loads like heating and air conditioning. And so coming up with passive thermal management solutions that did not require us to dip into our finite source of uh, electricity that we want to put in cars was a very, very big hurdle to, to cross. And frankly, it was the hardest thing uh, to solve on a, the whole product. The, you, you mentioned earlier that the product's called EVR 2020, and what that should be is an illustration of the fact that we are far better engineers than we are marketers. Uh, because actually, the, the, it is true that in 2020, we made a major structural change uh, to the product and that was why we 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 chose that name evr 2020 because and it also had the sort of provision of perfect eyesight and perfect vision and all that going along with it however here we are four years later having done lots to improve the product in that time um, and it particularly by the way as we've now branched out into europe we just expanded into europe at the end of last year and of course europeans look at you like 2020 what does that mean they you know they it has no other connotation to them so i think you should expect to see a change uh, there but uh, product's been constantly improving uh, since that time, and we're able to uh, get tremendous, uh, a very talented team of engineers uh, on staff here, aerospace background, maritime engineering backgrounds, energy engineering backgrounds, uh, all of the combination of those things, uh, which keeps eking out more and more energy from the same footprint. To, to your point about can the array be bigger? What's really crucial about EVARC is it fits inside a standard legal size parking space. 
And even more crucial, it doesn't reduce available parking in any way at all. This was another one of the big engineering uh, challenges that we had. We wanted something that you could drop off in a parking space, not have to bolt it down, not have to glue it down, not have to dig foundations or do any on-site work at all. It had to be zero on-site work. But at the same time, we could not reduce the available parking on the property because most jurisdictions have some kind of minimal parking requirement uh, for the use case on the property. And once you get that property permitted with, let's say, 100 parking spaces, if you drop a shipping container or a big lump of concrete or something in one of those spaces, you now go to 99 spaces. No developer ever deploys a space more than they need to because that's a cost center, not a revenue center. And so now you've just knocked the property out of, out of uh, compliance. One of the crucial things about EVARC is because of the way it's engineered, we're able to drop it in a parking space, have it survive. Actually, 185 mile an hour winds is what we've survived. We're rated for 160 mile an hour winds but, and stamped for that. Uh, flood proof to nine and a half feet as well, by the way. Uh, but it's able to do all of those things, but without reducing available parking. So you don't lose a parking space, even though we've put something in your space. We just made that parking space much more useful than it used to be. Because uh, after all, if you think about it, a parking space, once you park a car in it, is useful as for anything else. We've, ch we've sort of changed that dynamic.